So to introduce myself, my name is Nick Bleski. I work for USU Extension, our integrated pest management program. I'm also currently a master's student pursuing a degree in plant science. So a lot of my experience um, is involved with commercial vegetable production, plant pathology, entomology, pesticide application, and of course, general integrated pest management. So to kick us off, we're going to start with just going through some of the most common different arthropod pests that you might find in a greenhouse or you also might find them on your house plants indoors. You might find them in a high tunnel. They're very common and we'll just talk about how we can identify them, how we can monitor for them and how we can manage them. So the first one I wanna talk about that you guys are probably very familiar with is fungus gnats. So these are very, very small flies. They're only about three millimeters big. They kind of resemble mosquito, mosquitoes but they have these characteristic long legs and antenna. And then I don't know if you can tell, but on the wings, they have a Y-shaped thing. And if you see them flying around indoors, they kind of fly in short darting movements. And the females, they'll lay up to 200 eggs in the soil, usually on our potted plants. In this picture here, this is what the larvae looks like. And the larvae, they can live up to 20 days. And the problem is with these larvae, they can feed on the plant root hairs in the top few inches of the soil. And then they will go into this pupation stage within the soil before emerging into the adults and then continuing that life cycle. So some of the problems with fungus gnats is they can cause wilting and reduced vigor of our seedlings or transplants, and that could potentially kill them off. Young seedlings and plugs like you might grow in here are especially vulnerable. The adults, they won't feed on the plants, um, but they can be a nuisance just flying around in your face. Um, and I personally had some experience where the cotyledons would be touching the soil surface and then the larvae themselves would feed on the cotyledons. So if you have really young transplants, that can be a big problem. So when we manage fungus gnats, a couple of things we can do, you can see in this photo, these yellow strips. So these are yellow sticky traps. And this is a really large commercial greenhouse growing tomatoes but you can actually buy your own yellow sticky traps just to have in your own home or in your own small greenhouse. So these are good to just monitor and just kind of help trap the adult populations. Insect plants, um, or sorry, when you bring in plants to your greenhouse, you wanna inspect them carefully before purchasing um, for signs of infestation. Um, check your house plants before bringing them in back inside of the house to prevent infestation. And then if you overwater your trays or pots and there's poor drainage, that can result in fungus gnat infestation. So it's important to let the soil dry out completely before water, in between waterings to kill the larvae. Um, one technique that I've tried and found effective is the potato method. So you put a slice of potato on the soil surface and then the larvae can, which are usually found in the top few inches of the soil, will go up and start eating that potato okay, plant. Yeah. So mm -hmm. within 24 hours to 48 hours, you might find a bunch of larvae like here on this photo that you can see. And our threshold is about three to five larvae um, for smaller plants and then 15 to 20 in our more bigger production pots. So there are some natural enemies of fungus gnats that you can look into. The first one is the soil dwelling predatory mite. So these mites, they feed on the fungus gnat larva and other small insects and the bad mites. The adults are very, very small, less than one millimeter in length. They're tan in color and they have this shield shape on their back, which is a distinctive characteristic. They'll spend their entire life cycle in the soil and they're most effective when plants are grown in six inch containers or larger. 
They are cost effective and they can live the six to eight week, weeks and up to seven days without any food. Um, there's also beneficial nematodes. So these are obviously like worm-like parasitites. They're very effective at controlling fungus gnat larvae and they can occur in the potting soil media. They kill larvae by entering the body through um, natural openings and feeding on the contents and liquefy that's liquefied by bacteria from this nematode. And that'll eventually kill the fungus gnat larva. So as I kind of go through all these pests, I forgot to mention, I'll cover a lot of these natural enemies or beneficials. And at the end, I'll show you a site where you can look to find options of where you can purchase these actually for your own greenhouses. <clears throat> so the next one is really common. You guys might be familiar with it is damping off. So damping off is a disease it's, or it's a generic name for several different pathogens that can kill off our seedlings. So this can include Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Fusarium, and Pythothera. So what it is, it's a soil-borne fungi that kills seedlings that are just beginning to germinate that have only been growing for just a few days. So what happens is once a seed is planted and watered, these fungal spores or mycelium, they're called, will start to colonize the soil and the trays. And the spores, they have these appendages called flagella. And they'll use that to propel themselves um, through the soil until they find the plant root, usually in the tray, and that will infect your plant. So here's some photos of what that looks like. So here's some rainbow chart I started a few years ago. You can see all that vascular tissue is really dried and shriveled up. Um, this is caused by those different pathogens. So here's a microscopic image of what Pythium looks like. Here's a close-up image of in the soil. You can see where it's just shriveled up and this will, the plant won't live. And then here, this whole tray, you can see there's just a big infestation where a lot of these little cells had that um, damping off disease. So this is something that's pretty common with seed starting. So how we can prevent this is if you're working in a greenhouse, the best thing you can do is sterilize your benches um, using a 10% bleach solution and just thoroughly scrubbing it. Um, you can source brand new trays or pots year to year, every season. And if you do reuse your um, growing cells or pots year to year, just make sure that you sterilize them and make sure that they're clean to prevent those pathogens. And then if you do find um, an infestation like, like this, just throwing out those plants because likely the disease will just spread throughout the whole tray. Um, use clean water and then ensure seedlings are germinating well, so just ensuring there's adequate lighting, heating, and irrigation. And you can always buy seeds that are pre-treated with fungicides. So seeds with Theram is a common product. And then there's different fungicide or soil drenches that you can buy as well. So I listed some synthetic and organic options right here. So the next one you guys are probably very familiar with is spider mites. So there's actually several species of spider mites that you might find in your greenhouse. Some of the most common ones that we see in Utah include the two spotted spider mites. They're very, very small. You would need a hand lens to get a good look at them, but you might find them on the undersides of the leaves if you look closely. They're oval shaped, cream colored, and their bodies contain these two large, dark, visible spots. Um, the young mites, they may lack or they may not have the spots, but the populations can increase rapidly in hot, dry conditions, which a lot of our greenhouses might have. So the problem with these spider mites is they have these piercing mouth parts. So they will um, pierce the leaf cell walls with their mouth parts and suck out the cell contents, causing the leaves to become non-functional. So you might see this um, stippling pattern on the foliage. And 
So this can cause leaves to become non-functional. Um, if there's really heavy feeding, you might find some chlorotic damage. And then of course, look for this webbing. So here's a good photo. If you look close, you can see uh, extensive wet webbing and then all those spider mites. So the best thing you can do is to just monitor and keep an eye out for them early on before their populations film. So again, look for those symptoms I just described. You can shake the leaves onto a piece of paper and watch for the small little specks of the spider mites just falling down on the paper. That's a good monitoring technique. And of course, look for that webbing. Um, some beneficials that you can purchase include the Western predatory mite. So this is actually a native spider mite or a native predator to spider mites here in the Western US. It can tolerate the hot, dry conditions. Females can lay around 21 um, eggs over the course of their 30 day lifespan. And they primarily feed on the bad spider mites. So like the nymphs and then the adults. And they can be used both indoors in the greenhouse and then sometimes they can be released outdoors as well. And then we got this guy, this is a spider mite destroyer. So they're related to lady beetles actually, but they actually target high densities of spider mites. So the adults are tiny, um, they're black, and these females, they can eat up to 20 to 40 mites a day. So the next one is another common one that you guys are probably familiar with, and that's the thrips. So here in Utah, we have the onion thrips and then the Western flower thrips. And they could be a major problem for our greenhouse crops. So the adults are small, they're about two millimeters long with slender brown bodies and fringed wings. And they will lay up to 250 eggs on different flower blossoms, leaves, or young fruits. And then the larvae are cream colored, worm-like, and they will pupate in the soil. And the bigger concern with thrips is they can spread different viruses, which I see quite often in different greenhouses. So this can include the impatience necrotic spot virus or the tomato spotted wilt virus, which can affect a wide range of host plants. So the adults, they have like these beak-like mouth parts. So what happens is they will feed on the plants by scraping the plant cells and sucking out the juices. And then both flowers and leaves can show symptoms. So here's an example of a healthy leaf. And then here's one that's been affected by thrips. And the tissue can have like this bleached looking spots like you see over here in kind of the silvery appearance. And then another characteristic is these little black spots, which is actually the insect poop or frass. So I also put a picture here of a tomato with the tomato spotted wilt virus. You can see the symptoms here. And then here's a picture of some young seedlings. So you can kind of tell, you can see the subtle thrips feeding damage. So, and that can be really hard on these young plants, especially. So the cool thing about thrips is they're one of the only pests that you can use the blue sticky traps for. And they're, so you won't catch any other insects, just the thrips. So this is a common one that um, greenhouse users will use. Um, they're probably the smallest insect that we're gonna be talking about, maybe other than the spider mites. So you might wanna use a hand lens and then do that paper technique where you hold the paper underneath the plant, shake the foliage, and then you can try to find those thrips. Um, a lot of the larger greenhouses, they'll use something called indicator plants. So for example, the carpet blue petunia is one that the nursery industry uses a lot. So they will place those about every 30 feet inside the greenhouse. And this is can be, so how it works is these are the plants that the thrips will go to first. So it's a good way for them to indicate when there is a thrips problem. So I listed here some products for thrips and honestly, a lot of these um, 
different products will work for a lot of the pests we're talking about. So I listed them by active ingredient, um, the residential brand name. So these are products that you can find at IFA, Home Depot, Lowe's, or your local garden center. And then I also listed the commercial brands. So these are the ones that um, the large greenhouses or nurseries will use, and these require a pesticide applicator's license. So pyrethrin, um, so the Garden Tech brand, so Worry Free uses pyrethrin. Garden Tech 7 is a common one that I see at stores. And then there's organic options as well, like insecticidal soap, spinosad, and different horticultural oils. So the important thing is to always read the label, make sure. So these ones I've already checked in are okay to use inside different greenhouse structures, but that's another thing that you want to consider if you are buying um, different products or thinking about products is making sure one, can I spray it inside a greenhouse? Two, is it okay for me to use it on the pests that I'm trying to target? And another thing with greenhouses is they're going to have different re-entry intervals that are probably a little bit longer than what the re-entry interval would be in a field. So if you're interested in different specific products or want to know if something works, you can feel free to message me and we can go more in depth about that. Um, I want to talk about these two beneficial insects that you can actually purchase that can control thrips. The first one is a predatory mite, sometimes called the Swirsky mite, based off its Latin name. So they're about pale, these are these mites are pale yellow in color, and they can take on the color primarily of their diet. Um, they're really, really small, less than half a millimeter. They're not really distinguished from other predatory mites. And then the adults will lay one to four eggs per day, and they eat about five to six thrips larva per day. Um, so the next one is the minute pirate bug. So this is a whole genus of different um, little species that you can get. So the adults um, and the nymphs are both generalist predators, so this can include thrips. Um, so they're the only actually, sorry, they're the only actually biological agent that will eat the adult thrips. They can take up to eight weeks to become established and effective. So really they should be released in greenhouses right before infestations become severe, but only if there's enough prey available. Okay, so the next one is white flies. You guys probably have seen these. This is probably one of the most common ones that I see anyway. So the adults are, they have these yellowish bodies and then the white wings. The two species that we commonly see are the greenhouse white fly and the silver leaf white fly. So the adult females will lay up to 250 oblong eggs like this, usually in these circular patterns on the undersides of the leaves. And then the nymphs, look way different. So you wouldn't even guess that they're the same species, but they kind of resemble these scale crawlers and they're actually immobile, flat and translucent. So they don't do a whole lot, but basically they will feed in place for up to three weeks and they will remain on that same leaf for another week during this pupation stage. And then after it pupates, it becomes the adult and the life cycle continues. So white flies use their piercing straw-like mouthparts to suck the sap from the phloem of the plant stems and the leaves. And if there's a large enough populate, population, this can cause the leaves to turn yellow, appear dry or drop. Um, feeding can cause plant distortion or discoloration. And then white flies excrete honeydew, um, causing the leaves to become sticky or covered with black sooty mold that grows on the honeydew. So yeah, here's just some photos of varying infestation levels. So to manage the white flies, like these other pests we talked about, early and regular monitoring is essential. 
particularly for sensitive crops. So like if you're growing poinsettias, um, different flowers, bedding plants, and tomatoes. Conduct visual inspections for the flat nymphs on the undersides of the leaves, like this guy is doing here on the tomato plants. Of course, the yellow sticky traps are great, especially for monitoring populations and catching them. And then again, those indicator plants that we talked about that are used in the nursery industry. So some beneficials you can purchase to control white flies include this parasitic wasp. Um, it's really effective against the silverleaf white fly. Um, the adults are tiny yellow wasp with drooping black antenna. The females will lay a single egg underneath the body um, of the white fly nymph. And then after hatching, that wasp will attach itself to the underside of the white fly nymph, burrow inside, feed, parasitize that larva nymph, and after 12 days will emerge from the, <laughs> the dead white fly pupa. So that's kind of cool how the parasitic wasp works. Um, the other one is this predatory beetle. It's really small, it's dark, it's related to the lady beetles that we're familiar with. And it's highly suited for white fly, especially if there's big densities on them. Both the adult and the larva will feed on the white fly eggs and nymphs. And then the females have reddish heads, um, while the males tend to be darker in color. Okay, so you guys should all be very familiar with aphids. So as you know, aphids are pear-shaped, they have soft body insects, they're really small, not as quite as small as these other ones we talked about, but I'd say still less than like a few millimeters. They have these characteristic um, tailpipes or cornicles on the rear end of their abdomen, and they can sometimes shed like white exoskeletons, which people might confuse for the white flies we just talked about or really it's just the shedded skin of the aphid. So adults um, develop wings when the populations become too crowded or really high, and then they will move to other areas to feed. Um, usually in the outdoor settings, the aphids will lay their eggs on woody hosts. But with that desirable greenhouse environment, they will just continue their life cycle through and through as long as there's enough host plants. So some of the main symptoms to look out for is leaf curling, yellow distortion of the leaves, stunting, um, the sticky honeydew, like we see with the white flies, you will also see with the aphids. Um, and then aphids can also vector some different viruses we talked about, similar to the thrips. So here's a good photo of those shedded aphid skins. So they kind of look like white flies from a glance, but if you look closely, they're just the little exoskeletons. So when we're managing aphids, just like everything else, we want to make sure we're visually inspecting our crops and plants regularly. Um, we want to pay attention to the undersides of the leaves, especially those brand new growing points where the aphids like to hang out. Yellow sticky cards are good to attract the adult winged aphids. And then usually for different greenhouse, we recommend growers to set their own thresholds. It's dependent on the type of crop you're growing, how big your greenhouse is, and then the different cost of different sprays or beneficials you wanna purchase. So here's a table again, I included for aphids. And like earlier, a lot of these would be effective on the thrips, white flies, and other pests we talked about. But I listed by the active ingredient and then the different brand names that you might find in the store. So this could include the bifethrins, um, pyrethrins, different horticultural oils, insecticidal soaps. So there's just a lot of options. So these are all really effective, especially if you spray them directly on the aphids. And then of course, there are a lot of beneficial insects that you can purchase and release your greenhouse to control the aphids. So the first one you guys might be familiar with is the convergent lady beetles. So these are the ones that usually get all the attention for beneficial insects, but really they're just one of many like you've seen as we've been talking about. 
But convergent lady beetles are, they can vary in coloration. Obviously, they're usually orange or red. They can have up to 13 black spots. They're about four to seven millimeters long, and they have these short clubbed antennas. So both the adults and the larva of the lady beetle will feed on the aphids like this. And then the other one I want to talk about is there's actually several different parasitic wasps. So I just listed one example here, but the wasps work really well in the greenhouse, especially in the cooler temperatures. The adults are two millimeters long. Um, they are similar in appearance to like a small black ant with wings, but they have like these long, thin antenna. Their abdomen is striped, yellow to brown. Um, the life cycle consists of about two weeks as the larva inside of the aphid. So you can see here, we call this a mummified aphid where the wasp will lay its eggs inside. And then when it emerges, it'll have this circular exit hole. So if you see a lot of aphids like this, that's a good sign. That means there's some parasitism going on inside your greenhouse. Okay, so the last one I want to touch on is the muley bugs. So you guys also might be familiar with these ones. Um, I've seen them around in like a few greenhouses here in the state. They're very, very small, soft-bodied, oval-shaped insects that are covered with this white, powdery, waxed coating. And this is actually the female. The males look like this bottom photo right here. So they look very different. Um, Depending on the species, the waxy coating may be long or um, short with different tufts. This is what the eggs look like. They're usually in these kind of little cottony, cottony egg sacs. So once the eggs hatch, um, or sorry, I should say the females can lay up to 600 eggs in this cottony sac underneath her body. And then these will hatch into the crawler stage, which are yellow and waxless. waxless. And then upon settling, mealybugs are mostly immobile, but they'll form clusters or colonies on the plant. So here's a photo of what that looks like. They feed by sucking on the plant juices, reducing the plant vigor, and causing different leaves to turn yellow, will, and drop. They also excrete um, the honeydew substance, like these other pests we talked about, which can attract sooty mold, sooty mold and different feeding ants. So to manage them, again, visually inspect, keep an eye out for them. Look for the white flecks or cottony residue along um, the leaf mid ribs, um, the leaf stem axles and the undersides of the leaves and even near the base of the plants. Look for the different honeydew or sooty mold that might be present on your plants. And then if you control the ants, this can allow the parasitite and predators to better attack the mealybugs. So um, kind of the last two beneficials I want to talk about are this specific parasitic wasp here. Um, this one is one of the most commonly ones bred for greenhouse use um, and mealybug control. Um, females are about 1.5 to 2 millimeters long, so very small. They have this dull brown, orange color, this yellow triangular head, and then the antenna are distinctly black, white, banded and then the males are all black antenna and then this one's kind of cool this is called a mealybug destroyer so it's actually related to the lady beetle so they're shiny they have this bronze red colored head black thorax um their nickname cryptus based off the scientific name and then the larvae are covered in the white white wax and they actually resemble mealybugs but they're usually larger. And then both the larva and then the adults will feed on the mealybugs within, within the infestations. So there are some resources that you guys can check out. Um, I, they, we have this guidebook, it's called the Greenhouse Biocontrol in Utah. So a lot of these pests that I just talked about, you can find out more information in this guide. But more specifically, you can read about the different beneficial insects that you can purchase. And then, of course, you can always get information on our website. Um, if you guys see a pest in your greenhouse and you have a question about it, you can actually take a photo of it 
and text it to our Utah Plant Pest Diagnostic Lab, and we can help you identify what that problem is. And then, of course, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the pest advisories. Um, so this is basically an email listserv, and we will send you a notice about different pests that you want to look for um, throughout the growing season. And I'm actually planning to send one out this week for vegetable crops. So I'll talk a lot about these different greenhouse pests that I've been seeing and a few others. So go ahead and type in some questions. I do wanna show you guys where you can purchase these beneficial insects. So within that guide, so here's our website. If you go to our guidebooks, go to our greenhouse biocontrol in Utah. Here at the bottom, we list all the different places that you can purchase these insects. So um, applied bionomics, the beneficial insectary, biocontrol network, Coper is one. 